As I drove up to the house, I saw the despondent mother sitting on the dry curb, screaming and crying. A police officer and a couple neighbors tried to calm her, but nothing seemed to work. Her pale face looked ghostly. Her constant tears dribbled mascara down her face, as if she were sobbing black, oily tears. Her hair stuck up in crazy strands and knots. I put the ambulance in park, turning off the flashing lights. My colleague, Amber, sat in the passenger seat. I'm not sure what we're supposed to do here, Amber said, smoothing a lock of straight black hair back over her ear. Her many flashy earrings showed pentagrams, pyramids, and the Tau serpent cross. Her body was covered in dozens of tattoos showing Alex Gray paintings and the occult symbols. A serpent eating its own tail was engraved in her arm. Each of the scales on the serpent's body seemed to be a different color of some dark rainbow. A solid gold hand of Fatima sat on her chest, the gleaming eye and the two-thumbed hand lidless and blue. Amber's name was fitting as her eyes truly were amber, and her skin was as pale as a vampire's. What could we do at any truly disturbing incident? I asked. We're just faceless messengers of the bureaucratic system. Isn't this just a body recovery at any point? Yeah, probably. Well, we could at least declare the time of death, I said, pushing the door open. We might need to give a sedative to the mother. She seemed like she's on the verge of snapping. The dry autumn breeze felt cool and clean as it blew over my skin, smelling of fallen leaves, pumpkins, and the faint breeze of winter. I grabbed my bag from the center of the ambulance. The choking sobs and whispered incomprehensible words of the grieving mother drifted through the breeze like a whisper. Why don't you go inside and I'll take care of the woman? Amber asked, raising a thin, perfectly plucked eyebrow. How come I always get the wet job? I protested jokingly, but I headed towards the front door anyway. Amber gave me a low, sardonic chuckle as she stayed close to my side. If you want to deal with the insane, grieving mother instead, she began, but I cut her off, sighing. No, I'll go inside and I'll check out the boys' room, I said. A cool breeze suddenly felt too hot on my skin. I felt like I was floating, my soul burning up. Something like an invisible skeletal fist clenching my heart. I don't know what had come over me, but the feeling passed as suddenly as it had begun. Amber gave a slight nod and walked off. I stood on the front stoop for a couple long seconds, breathing hard. I was covered in rivulets of sweat. The door stood open a fraction of an inch. Behind it, the house looked as dark as a black hole. The door flew open. I jumped, my eyes widened as I peered inside the blackness. A man stood in a worn long coat. He had very dark eyes and a face like a tired basset hound. I immediately recognized the ugly mug of Detective Larson, our local police department's homicide detective. I was never happy to see Detective Larson. Whenever his watery, droopy eyes swept over a house or a car, it meant something truly disturbing had happened there. Detective Larson was like the angel of death. As any time I saw him, I knew there would be blood, tortured bodies, slashed throats, or gapping bullet wounds hiding behind the bland facade of a normal-looking home. In most cases, I could do nothing more than put the white sheet over the victim's sightless eyes and pale, bloodless faces before calling the time of death. Detective Larson, I said, nodding at him in respect. Anthony, he said to me. Looking closer at him, 
I realized his normal, cold, dissociated stare was gone. He looked genuinely disturbed, far more than I had ever seen him before. What's wrong? I asked, a sinking feeling in my chest. His droopy face looked paler than I had ever seen it. He wavered on his feet. I wondered for a moment if he might pass out. I took a step forward in case I had to catch him, but he took a deep breath and steadied himself. Are you feeling okay? I think you should go in and see for yourself. Detective Larson whispered as sweat trickled down his pale face. I can't go back in there right now. I need a few moments outside. He pushed past me into the cool autumn day. I walked into the silent, empty house. With Detective Larson outside, I found myself alone except for a single police officer standing guard outside a closed door. He saw my paramedic's uniform and gave me a silent nod as he opened the bedroom door with a gloved hand. The smell of copper and iron was strong in the air. I immediately recognized it was the odor of blood. I took a deep breath before I walked into the room, closing my eyes and mentally preparing myself. I had no idea what to expect, but I knew it wasn't going to be pretty. I saw a little boy's room, decorated with superhero posters all over his wall. Toys were scattered in the corner, as if he had just gotten up in the middle of playing with them. Batman blankets covered his bed, but that wasn't the only thing on it. In the middle of the bed, there was a puddle of something wet and red. It reminded me of roadkill that had been run over hundreds of times on the highway until it turned into a jelly of fetid rotted gore. It almost looked like someone had exploded. Instead of spontaneous combustion, our town apparently had a problem with spontaneous exploding bodies. This image made me feel like I was standing on the edge of madness for a brief moment. I had an insane urge to laugh, but I quickly choked it down. The boy's clothes were haphazardly mixed into the puddle of smashed organs and bone splinters that soaked into the comforter. The mess of gore slowly dripped over the edges of the bed, the rhythmic tapping of the blood drops hitting the wooden floor marking the time like a water clock. Oh God, I whispered to myself. Suddenly, the bedroom door slammed shut behind me. I jumped, spinning to face it. On the other side, I heard the police officer knocking and jiggling the doorknob. Don't lock the door, he yelled. This is a crime scene. What the hell do you think you're doing? I didn't close it, I screamed. You did. There was a long pause. I heard something give a low, tortured squeak behind me like a rusty door being opened. The police officer slammed his fist against the door a couple of more times before he ran off yelling. I heard a note of rising panic in his voice. I slowly turned my head, feeling odd and surreal. I didn't know what was happening. I caught a glimpse of a trap door in the ceiling, partially opened. A bloody hand with pale, loose-fitting skin held the edge of it. Something wet slithered up there. A face peered through the opening. It had human skin covering its trembling skeletal body. On its head, it wore the boy's face like a mask. The bloody, sagging flesh reminded me of Leatherface. I stepped back in horror, my back slamming against the door. I heard yelling from the other side, Detective Larson's deep, distinctive voice booming throughout the house. The thing in the ceiling laughed like a gunshot. It released the trap door, letting it swing open. With barely a sound, it jumped down into the bedroom, staring at me. It stood only five feet tall, its back slightly hunched, 
its skeletal arms hanging out in front of it. The naked, pale flesh was stuck to it in segments. The skin covering its face ended at the neck, with a ragged, bloody line stretching across it. The torso skin covering looked tanner, large and even looser. It appeared this eldritch creature had peeled different parts of the flesh off of different victims. I saw its yellow, glowing eyes flickering like candle flames behind the mask of human skin. They had no pupils and no sclera, but looked like flat golden plates that seemed to catch every ray of light in the room. It oozed across the hardwood floor towards me, jerking and twitching. Its breath gurgled in its mouth. Black, frothy blood bubbled over its twisted, broken teeth. I closed my eyes, hoping it was just a nightmare. When I opened them, the thing was only a few feet away, its golden eyes sparkling with an inhuman hunger. The door stayed closed and locked like a concrete wall behind me. I frantically tried playing with the doorknob and turning the lock, but nothing happened. The yelling from the house was close now, right outside the door. Long strands of frothy saliva dripped from the creature's chattering mouth as it silently tiptoed closer to me. I heard a key in the lock and the jingling of the doorknob. With my back pressed hard against the door, I instantly fell out of the boy's room when it flew open, landing on my back in the middle of three police officers and Detective Larson. I looked up at them, stunned and disbelieving for a long moment. Wordlessly, I pointed to the room, my teeth still chattering. The thing was gone, but the trap door and the ceiling still stood open. Like a pendulum, it swayed gently back and forth above the bloody pile of organs and shredded muscles on the bed. What could have done something like this? I asked Detective Larson as we stood outside. The pale autumn sunlight barely warmed me. I felt like ice water ran through my veins. What was that thing? He shook his head, his jowls shaking. I don't know about any thing, but we'll examine the trap door. He said, his eyes distant. The last one had a trap door in the ceiling too. Odd, huh? The last one? I asked in a hushed tone. What do you mean the last one? He met my gaze suddenly. Forget about it. Police business. But I will say this isn't the first odd death we had seen in this town recently. Detective Larson said cryptically. Something came down out of the trap door, I whispered. You have to believe me. Probably the same thing that killed that kid. This thing, it wasn't human. Not even remotely. It wears human skin like a jester might put on a colorful costume. And the way it moves is jerky, twitching. It had pure yellow eyes. Should we get a sketch artist for this? Detective Larson asked sarcastically, checking his watch for the time. I looked at him with an expression of sudden coldness. Fine, but trust me, I'm not freaking crazy. I hissed with venom. I slipped my business card into his hand. When you investigate that tunnel up there and find out I'm right, you could call me and apologize. I turned away without another word, seeing the distraught mother had gone. More emergency personnel had arrived, including the meat wagon the county morgue's personal vehicle for transporting dead bodies. Amber stood next to the ambulance, her arms crossed, a single eyebrow raised. Let's get the F out of here, I muttered to her. The kid is dead, official time of death. I looked down at my watch. Let's just say five minutes ago, 4.25 p.m. Come on, our shift is ending in a few minutes. I could drive. Amber said, jumping into the driver's seat. Moodily, I slunk into the passenger seat. So, how was it? 
the kid got turned into a jelly paste, I said, feeling sick at the memory. It looked like he exploded or got ran over by 20 tractor trailers in a row. His skin was... I stopped, thinking back to what I had seen. His skin was all gone. Something must have taken it away. Well, that has to be the most disgusting thing I've heard all day. Amber said as she pulled away, the lights and sirens of the ambulance silenced. So we have a serial killer skinning people alive and smashing them to bits with a sledgehammer? Skinning children alive, I should say? It's no serial killer, I said, explaining what had happened. How the door had slammed shut by itself, how the trap door had opened and how something had jumped down. I know what I saw, but it happened exactly like I said. Detective Larson acts like he doesn't believe me, but when I got there, he was just standing outside, and he looked deeply disturbed about something. Far more disturbed than I had ever seen him before. I think he knows I'm telling the truth and is trying to gaslight me for some reason. I always thought Detective Larson was made of iron. Amber said as we turned back to the hospital to park the ambulance to finish our shift. He had never shown any hint of emotion around me. So what happened with the mother? I asked, curious. I had started to calm down by this point, and even though I kept flashing back to my encounter with that creature, I felt instantly better as we put more distance between ourselves and that house. Amber looked over at me strangely. Well, she was rambling about how something had been slinking around the house at night, and she should have known, she said. She wouldn't stop crying. She was suicidal, kept blaming herself for her son's death. I ended up giving her a shot to benzos to calm her down, and the EMT took her to the hospital. She'll probably end up in a psych ward for a couple days. I don't know. She's in a real bad shape. The mother was there when the boy was killed? I asked, horrified. If it was a serial killer, how could someone have even done that? Skinning a person alive and beating their body into a paste had to be loud. It would draw attention, I'd think. We don't know that the boy was alive when he was skinned, she said. She shuddered. I really hope not. CSI needs to check it out. I'm sure they'll figure out what happened. Yeah, I'm sure. I said noncommittally a sinking feeling in my stomach. I didn't say anything about it to Amber, but in reality, I don't think the mother was crazy at all. I got back to my house late that night. I ended up sitting in the locker room at the hospital for a few minutes, simply staring at the wall. I couldn't get the day's events out of my head. A rising sense of anxiety seemed to fill my chest. Amber drove me home, speeding and blaring music the entire way. We only lived a couple of streets away from each other, so we usually carpooled the work. The autumn leaves whipped past the car. The wind howled like the screaming of a dying child. You want to come in? I asked her. I have beer and stuff if you want one. Sure. She said, giving me a sideways glance. You don't seem much like yourself today. I just want to forget everything I'd seen today, period, I said, making my way out of the car. Amber followed close behind. Lethargically, I made my way up to my apartment. I opened a couple of bottles of Spaten and gave one to her. I chugged the entire bottle in a few giant gulps turning on the TV to shatter the eerie silence that seemed to cover the apartment like a storm cloud. As I went into my room to change, my heart leapt into my throat. A trap door I had never seen before stood at my ceiling, the rusted brown metal gate swinging open as if it had just been disturbed. For a long moment, I could only stand there, stunned and disbelieving. I hoped I was hallucinating, that I had gone crazy. I turned to run out of there. 
I opened my mouth to scream at Amber to run, to get out of there immediately. But a skeletal hand with fingers like sharpened stakes shot out from under the bed. It wrapped around my ankle. Where it touched me, I felt a shock of freezing agony as if liquid nitrogen had sprayed all over my skin. Amber! I cried. Run! Get out of the... But that was all I had gotten to say before I slid away under the bed. The bright, normal world all around me grew smaller and smaller as I disappeared under the blanket covering the side. I looked back, seeing that naked, hunched back abomination grinning at me. Jerkily, it slithered forward, its bony hands and feet clicking softly against the floor. It crawled right on top of me. Something like a freezing wind seemed to emanate from its entire body. A smell like ozone and rotting meat hissed from its lips. I heard the bedroom door slam shut against the wall. Help for God! The creature clamped its hands down around my mouth. I felt small pieces of rotting flesh and flakes of ancient blood fall like dandruff all over my face. Hissing, it lowered its gnarled, gnashing teeth into my ear. Anthony? Amber said, sounding scared and uncertain. I heard her footsteps heading over to the bed. I continued the fight against the abomination, trying to push it off me and continuously twisting my head away, but I knew it was just playing with me. If it wanted, it could tear my entire throat out in a matter of seconds. As Amber went to lift the blanket hanging over the side of the bed, the creature snapped its head forward and bit my nose. Blood exposed all over my face. The cartilage broke with the sound like cracking eggs. I hadn't realized what had happened for a long second until pain like lava ripped its way through my body. I shrieked, fighting hard. Amber threw the comforters off my bed. My vision had turned white with the agonizing, brutal pain. Warm crimson streams gushed from my destroyed nose. I felt a hand grab me by the shirt collar and suddenly, I was sliding out from the dark pit of horrors, the abomination still writhing and struggling on top of me. The loose human skin it wore made it hard to get a hold of it as the bloody covering kept sliding under my hands. Get off him, psycho! Amber shouted as she pulled a pocket knife out. She flicked it open and brought it down hard into the back of the creature's neck. All three inches of the silvery, gleaming blade disappeared into the thing's body. It screamed, a sound like an ancient steam whistle about to explode. It writhed off me, its arms and legs slithering and writhing like snakes. The thing tried to drag itself back towards the trap door, but Amber had other plans. She put her heavy boot on top of its back, pushing it to the ground. After meeting my eyes for a brief second, she knelt down and ran the sharp blade across the abomination's throat. Black blood, the consistency of maple syrup, flowed like a waterfall from the thing's slashed throat as it gurgled and hissed died down to nothing. God, it hurts, I said, grabbing my mutilated nose. Did that thing bite it off? Do I still have a nose, Amber? Tell me the truth. She gave a crooked half-smile at this. Yes, you still have a nose, Anthony, she said, rolling her eyes. Except for the piece at the end. He got that. I think you have some scars, sad to say. That's okay, I said, trying to stem the bleeding. I was never very pretty anyways. I'm just glad to be alive. Amber went over to the master bathroom and grabbed a roll of toilet paper. She gave it to me. I started tearing off chunks trying to stop the bleeding from my destroyed nose. It still burned like it was on fire. I can't believe I'm not dead. I thought I was a goner for sure. I owe you my life. She winked at me. I'm sure you'll be able to pay me back soon, she said as clunks and bangs came from the trap door above us. 
I looked up at the black square in the ceiling with its rusted hinges and ancient metal door, the pain making my eyes water. Amber glanced as well as another one of those pale, naked things silently slipped out, landing on top of her. She screamed as it knocked her to the ground, clawing and biting. Weak from the blood loss and pain, I tried pushing myself to my feet, but I was too slow. In horror, I watched its sharp bony fingers come up and stab into the side of Amber's neck. They disappeared into her. Her eyes widened. Her mouth opened in a silent scream as bright red arterial blood spurted from the wounds. Splatters of it covered my face and chest, still hissing with laughter and grinning behind its mask of human skin. The abomination continued digging its stake-like fingers through her neck, wriggling them to widen the wounds. Feeling sick and weak, I couldn't watch anymore. Wet sloshing sounds followed me into the hallway as I crawled away. Another one of those abominations jumped down, sprinting after me. I knew I was doomed. Yet as its pale, naked body got close to me, it gave a gurgling hiss of victory. Something strange happened. It slithered over me on all fours, but when it came into contact with the splatters of Amber's blood, it screamed and pulled away. Its steam whistle cry followed me through the front door. As I looked back, I saw more of those things clawing out the trap door, using their sharp scalpel-like fingers to take off Amber's skin. Her horrified eyes continued watching me as the light in them faded, and fresh puddles of blood and discarded meat soaked the floor. I ran to my car, hyperventilating. I called Detective Larson and told him to go to my apartment, that it was happening again. He had many questions, but I turned my phone off and drove out of there without a backwards glance. I abandoned everything I owned in that town, renting a motel in the next state over. I heard the local news about the spike in recent murders and disappearances in Frost Hollow. I ended up going to talk to a college professor who supposedly knew about demons and fey and other supernatural creatures still wearing a bandage on my face. She was a strange, bird-like woman, advanced in years with glasses that magnified her eyes in owlish proportions. She invited me over to her house, a stuffy place with old books on the occult and powerful talismans from voodoo and shamanism plastered all over the walls. As I told her everything that had happened, she started playing with her tarot cards, flipping them over. Her wrinkled, serious eyes took in the images without a word. This is your reading, she said, nodding to the cards. I told her I didn't want to know. She sighed. The blood of a friend who gave their lives, either essentially or unintentionally, to protect someone else is a powerful thing, she said flipping over the next tarot card. The Jester. I saw he wore his colorful clothes, adorning himself in blood red and yellow cloth. I could only think of that thing seeking around the tunnels behind those trap doors. Yet, if it continues following me, how could I possibly escape next time? I asked. She shrugged, her face unconcerned. We all get captured by death eventually, she said. You can't run forever, after all. Perhaps next time you will be the one giving your life to protect someone else. I shuddered at the thought, my body cold. As I drove back to my motel, I was wondering if she was right. Would they catch up with me in the end? I opened the motel room door. There, in the ceiling... I saw a rusted trap door, its hinges giving a tortured shriek of rusted metal. A small face wearing dead, mummified skin like a mask peeked over the edge, grinning. <laughs>